you and I have a desire to know the world in which we live. Like the sons of Issachar in Chronicles, they knew the times in which they lived and they knew what to do. Now the war in Israel, in the Middle East, has been going on for oh, 360 days now or more, I can't remember. Remember 1948, 1967 and 1973, the war was just like over, done, short war. But this is going on. There's scriptures that when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, ooh, what does that mean? Yes, it happened in 70 AD. And, um, you know, when we read the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And so the rest of the revelation over 22 chapters fills in those blanks. Today I'm going to take sections out of Revelation 5 and Revelation 11 and help us and draw us what our participation is today, whether Jesus comes on our watch, our children's or grandchildren's, or further in 200 years' time. What's our responsibility in the nature of the revelation of Jesus Christ given to show the ch to speak to the churches? And so if you've got your Bible there, turn to Revelation chapter 5. I'm sorry, I don't have the scriptures on the screen today, um, but there's a little bit of reading today. Um, and um, John's in vision. Now remember Peter, John and James were on the Mount of Transfiguration and the three of them saw the same vision? And it's like a technicolor dream of such an intense level that you're not just a spectator, you were lifted up in the Holy Spirit into the transcendent and to write about it later is a phenomenal task because very vivid. You know, you read about today where John's weeping in this vision. Have you ever woken up in a, in a very intense dream and wept? <laughs> and I have. Um, anyway, let's Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And John says, In vision I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now today we have a book. But those days parchments were rolled up and wax seals were applied on them to make sure that they were only opened by those who intended to open them up. And so the one who's sitting on the throne, um, we understand, as we, is God the Father in that vision. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And John becomes very personally involved at this point. He says, I began to weep loudly. And when you see a grown man cry, it affects everybody around us. Because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So John isn't just a bystander seeing something. He's actually quite immer emotionally and mentally and psychologically and spiritually immersed in his vision. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God, the, house, the, the, the descendant from David is Jesus Christ. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Now, Revelation is this highly symbolic. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. With seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. So the father on the throne, by his own authority, holds in his right hand a sequence of appointed times and events that no one is worthy to open except the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And when he'd taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb in, a, in a, an act of worship, of adoration, of gladness that Jesus is worthy, each holding a harp, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So today, you and I prayed, and Scripture looks at them as golden bowls of incense, something so special of the highest order. And whatever is written in this scroll, only Jesus is worthy to open. It comes from the Father, it's given to the Lamb, and then we start reading. I'm not going to go with them all because we haven't got five hours. We see the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The white horse, the, the black horse, the pale horse, the, the, the different coloured horses. 
we see the 144,000, a metaphoric image of the redeemed saints. Then we see the innumerable multitude from every tribe and kingdom and nation and language come out of great tribulation, praising God and the Lamb. We see angels blowing trumpets. There are seven trumpets and the impact of God's righteousness and God's judgment on a wicked and evil society. Do you know what society looks like as God is knocking on the door of hearts and minds of people? Revelation 9.21 tells us they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Now I have given you chapter after chapter after chapter from Revelation 5 all the way to 9 in just a few seconds. It makes a very good Bible study. So let's go to Revelation chapter 10. We see the scroll being perpetuated further in this imagery, in the symbolism. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. A mighty angel wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head and his face was like the sun and his leg like pillars of fire. So John gives us a description of this mighty angel. He had a little scroll in his hand and the, and either the scroll was little or the angel was so big because the angel sets his foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. When I was, much, I think I was 19 years old, I got an eight by four piece of masonite and I painted the world and I painted this angel standing on top of the world holding a scroll. I was only 19 then, eventually I got rid of the painting because I found Revelation too comprehensive to try to take a snapshot and put it into acrylic paint. And he set his right foot on the sea and left foot on the land. In verse 3, and he called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring. I saw a kid's cartoon the other day with a lion roar, and I thought, oh dear, that's a horrific, scary sound. And when he called out, the seven thunders sound, sounded. Now, I'm going to jump a few verses to verse 8. So this, this mighty angel has a scroll in his hand. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again. Go... Take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So this is not just a spectator vision. John is so immersed in it that he speaks with his angel and now John is told to do something. So I went to the angel in verse 9 and told him, give me the little scroll. And he said to me, now this is very interesting, the scroll that was in the father's hand was given to the lamb, now carried by the angel, is given to John to do what? To eat it. <laughs> he said, take and eat it. It'll make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it'll be sweet as honey. So John says in verse 10, I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. Now this is a level of vision where you become so personally deeply involved. Um, it was sweet as honey in my mouth, and when I'd eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And straight away we have some questions. Revelation raises a lot of questions as to the symbolism. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. So John was given a job of sending this letter to the churches in Ephesus all the way down to Laodicea in Asia Minor, seven churches where Turkey is today. And the question that we have, did John again go out and preach to many nations and peoples and languages? Well, we don't know. We don't know. We know that John wrote to many house churches. But his participation on this international level is a question that we can ask, is it bigger than just John's commission for first century um, demographics? And for you and I, it sounds very interesting. When you go back to Ezekiel, you will see that Ezekiel eats a scroll, very, very similar to John's experience and vision. And John's testimony is, thus says the Lord, a prophet conveys what God says <coughs> in a very powerful, personal way. And this became personal because Jesus said, do you remember when Jesus said, I am the bread of life? Whoever eats this bread will live forever. In other words, what John is given is the written word on a scroll that becomes part of him, his identity, his purpose and his message. It's not just something that you say, oh, I'm just saying what somebody else told me to say. He's actually eaten the bread of life, so to speak. Now, what I wanted to do today, and I, know, I thought it'd be a bit corny, we have rolls of a packet of rice paper. And for the children, or even for us, I was going to make a little scroll and put it in my mouth and chew it now to, to demonstrate in a, in a colourful way this imbibing 
This message, this powerful message. You know, what we eat becomes part of us. Very powerful. Jesus says to the church in Revelation, if anyone hears my voice and I knock at the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. In other words, a symbol of covenantal relationship is like at the Lord's Supper. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. I am the bread of life. Drink from this cup, says Jesus, all of you. Um, and John is to embark as a witness for Jesus from the highest authority, from the Father. And he must again prophesy to many languages, peoples, nations and kings. So the question that we can ask, did John do that to the fullest extent? Or is this a more bigger prophetic word of what is to come? And how did the churches handle it? Because if this is a work for the church, we look at the first century church, from the loveless church in Ephesus, from the dead church in Sardis, from the non-Christ-oriented church in Laodicea, and the other churches in between, we have some questions to ask. Now, you and I have a lot of questions, and that's why we asked a question over dinner, on dinner last night. If you had a question to ask God something, what would you ask? What would you ask of him? You know, because sometimes I think, oh, wow, God. And yet Jesus says, in that day you will ask nothing of me. And I'm thinking, some, when we are glorified, every answer will be given to us. But if we go back to the first century, you know, can you think of people that you've known and loved and do you remember their last words to you? I remember Phil's last words when he died two years ago. And I remember my grandmother's last words and I remember the last words of several people. I want to give you the last words of Jesus before he ascended back to heaven. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. Um, Luke tells us, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. So he's talking to his disciples. There's 11. Judas is off the scene. But among his disciples were always the faithful women. The women who were ministering to them out of their needs for three and a half years. The women who stood by the crucified Jesus when the other disciples fled. And the women who are still there, the Mary, the Mary Magdalene, the Joanna and the Susanna. And Jesus says to this small group, you will be my witnesses. Beginning in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, which they were familiar with, and to the ends of the earth. Now, you and I live in Western Australia. We're near Perth, the world's most isolated capital city. There's a level of saturation of the gospel that's happened over 2,000 years. Verse 9 from Acts chapter 1. And when he'd said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Jesus' last words, you will be my witnesses. It's interesting that the purpose of God and the Lamb transmitted by the angel, was given to a human, John. You know, it seems that God wants to, for us to be his witnesses. And so you and I can ask a very personal question. Are we walking, talking, effigies, images of Jesus Christ in everything we say and do? Do we understand the stewardship of witness? That's why I read Brian Larson's comments about speaking the truth in love and the challenges we face in a society that gets offended very easy. Do we take this stewardship of witness personally to talk and proclaim the Lord as much as we can? I want to take it a little bit further. So we're going to get jump to Revelation chapter 11 now. And this paints it even further, what witness looks like and how, how it involves you and me. It's not just for those who have the gift of the gab to speak about Jesus. It's for all of us. But I want to take what it looks like because Revelation says, in Revelation chapter one, chapter 11, verse 1, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar of those who worship there. In other words, God is drawing a line between the righteous and the unrighteous, the sanctified and the unsanctified. You know what Jesus said of the end time? Pray that you may be worthy to escape these things and to stand before the Son of Man. In other words, you're offered divine protection and providence from the worst calamity that's coming in the world. Verse 2, But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. And then at that time... I will grant authority to my two witnesses 
and they will prophesy for 1260 days, which is three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. That last part of the verse comes exactly out of Ezekiel. The olive tree and the lampstands. Um, the olive tree symbolises the, the work of the Holy Spirit. And the lampstand is the light of the Spirit. Anyway, let's continue. And if any, verse 5, anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how it is to be killed. The power of the Holy Spirit, which is the Word of God, spoken by these witnessing in unprecedented times that's never happened before, will never happen again. And it talks about the type of things that they do. Listen. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may, call, may, no rain may fall in the days of their prophesying. Which prophet do we associate? Saying, okay, there's no more rain until I say so. And for three and a half years after that, there was no more rain in the reign of King Ahab with Elijah. And when at the end of three and a half years, Elijah meets Ahab and Ahab says, are you the troubler of Israel? Beautiful story in, in, in the book of Kings. And they have the power over waters to turn them into blood. Which biblical character did that? Moses in Egypt, one of the ten plagues. And to strike the worth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. A wicked, sinful world, witnesses for Christ, who, you know, you, you can see them as Christ-centred, spirit-formed, Bible-based, godly witness in a corrupt generation. And when they've finished their testimony, 1260 days, three and a half years, the beast that arises from the bottomless place will make war on them, conquer them and kill them and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt where the Lord was crucified. So the Lord of these two witnesses, Jerusalem is where they'll be killed, is regarded as Sodom. You know what God judged Sodom for? A wicked city. Egypt, enslavement, a symbol for sin. And Jerusalem is everything that it shouldn't be. You know what Jerusalem means? Yaru Shalom in Hebrew? City of peace. For three and a half days, some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse them to be placed in a tomb. That's a shocking thing. When you think about somebody who dies, you give them the dignity of a burial, whether they were your friend or whether they were your enemy. But these are unusual times. In fact, people celebrate their death. I mean, they could be regarded as Christian terrorists because they, they spoke in the public square and what they spoke was the truth of God and nobody wants to hear God's truth. And so they hated for it. And those who dwell on earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents. Because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. What did Jesus say? I send you prophets and wise men and you kill them all. Anyway. But after the three and a half days, and we don't really know why three and a half days here. So we have some questions. A breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. So they were dead. It's not as if they were just mildly resuscitated after a bit of a hiccup. No, their dead bodies were something that people rejoiced over. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And as they went up in heaven in a cloud, the enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, a tenth of the city fell, 7,000 people were killed in an earthquake, and the rest were terrified. And guess what happens? And gave glory to the God of heaven. Sometimes it takes drastic and cataclysmic things to speak to a hardened heart deceived by the devil himself. But finally, the, the light of Christ has reached and the work of your witness, my witness, and specifically the two witnesses, has been about the Lord's work. There's a lot of it. Now, Revelation is highly symbolic, but woven within the symbolism is a level of literalism as well. And the two witnesses replicate the work of Elijah, and Moses. Remember on the Mount of the Transfiguration? Two prophets appeared with Jesus and Peter, John and James saw them. Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus and, and Luke tells us they were talking about the imminent suffering that Jesus was going to go through. None of the other Gospels tell us what the conversation was, but Luke does. And we wrestle with that, the image of Elijah to come. I want you to turn back to Malachi 
because Malachi speaks of Moses and Elijah as well. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming. And if you read um, um, elsewhere in there, it's the great day of the Lord. The day is coming, burning like an oven, Malachi 4, 1, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, that will neither leave neither of them root or branch. Verse 4 of chapter 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for Israel. The very next verse says in verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So there's a promise that Elijah has been and Elijah is coming in the day of the Lord. Now, when John the Baptist came, he was like Elijah. He wore a goat of camel's hair, he ate wild honey, and he had a leather belt. And people said, John, are you the prophet? Are you Elijah? And John said, no, I'm not. But if we turn to Matthew chapter 11, Jesus refers to this Elijah in John the Baptist and to the Elijah to come. Matthew 11, beginning of verse 13, For all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. So John the Baptist was a type of Elijah. John didn't say, no, I'm not. I'm unworthy to tie the shoes of him who's coming after me. But Jesus attributed to him the spirit and work of Elijah. And if we go to Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 11, then they asked Jesus, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? A very good question. Verse 12, then he answered and told them, indeed Elijah is coming first and restores all things. In the book of Malachi, he restores the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. This ministry of reconciliation in an age of generational breakup. Our younger generation are struggling for identity. And so they go down all the different rainbow coloured paths in the world only to be finally be sadly disappointed. Anyway, and how it is written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. So Elijah, remember Moses' body was never found? Elijah was taken. And, and so Moses and Elijah were sort of, there was like, uh, we know Satan disputed the body of Moses, but they were taken. And yet here, the spirit of Moses and Elijah on these two prophets, now they're dead. Their bodies lie in the great city of Sodom or Egypt, which is known as Jerusalem, and visible for everybody to see. And so the Elijah and Moses' ministry really finish at that point. Very powerful when you start thinking about it. So, so when you put those scriptures together, you begin to have more questions. When? How? Why? What are you doing, God? The church is entrusted with a message of salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you are my witnesses. The spirit of witness is the heart of the collective church. It's not just to say, oh, one day God will raise up two prophets and they'll do all the work and I just need to pay and pray. Yes, you need to pay, we need to pay and pray, but we need to have a testimony. The saints are those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. We have something to say in Jesus' name. Now, the ancient Israelites didn't want to hear God. He spoke from Mount Sinai and they said, Oh no, it's just too much. Moses, tell God to speak to you and, you, and, and we'll listen to you. And so from that came the same with God chose to take the scroll, give it to the lamb. The angel takes the scroll, gives it to John and says, Eat it. And John is sent to the churches. So God chooses to use human vessels to reflect his glory because people are more likely to listen to each of our testimony than they are to God. It's a sad reality. A very powerful, very insightful, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And what jo because John ate the scroll, he became identified by it and became his core ministry. And when you think about Elijah and Moses and their ministry as it will be in the future, 
they're not just two wannabes who decide to be historical characters and assume it on themselves. They're anointed. They're appointed by God. And standing beside them, around them, is a great cloud of witnesses, to use the words out of the book of Hebrew. Because we, the book of Hebrew says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, faithful people who lived, as, as, as told in, in Hebrews chapter 11, you and I are all witnesses of Jesus. And we all have a testimony. And Moses and Elijah's ministry interestingly represents the law and the prophets. The law is not done away with. Jesus is the fulfilment of the law. Very powerful. You know, we see Moses and Elijah in the Mount of Transfiguration and we see Jesus that he came to fulfil the law and the prophets. And the imagery of the two appointed Witnesses points to a strong Christ-centred, spirit-formed, Bible-based testimony. I can add to that Sabbath celebrating because the Ten Commandments have never been abrogated. They still stand strong as God's moral law that brings us to Christ. Brothers and sisters, do you comprehend the nature that you and I are a special place in history? That we have a word to share? Jesus is Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't be apologetic. You know, Jesus said, He who denies me before men, I will deny before my Father and his angels. But he who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father and all his angels. You know, why two witnesses? That's a very interesting question. Well, two is the number of witness. You read a lot of different numbers in the Bible. Like number 40 is, the, is a a number associated with trial and, and difficulty. Number seven, one of completion. Um, um, two is the witness. Um, remember Jesus sent his 72 disciples out by pairs? A matter is established by two witnesses according to scripture. You know, Jesus says in John chapter 8 verse 17, in your Lord is written that the testimony of two people are true. So you have Moses and Elijah type of witness affirming each other. Very powerful, very interesting. You know, what about a problem in the church? Matthew chapter 18 talks about that. Go to your brother and your brother alone. And if your brother won't hear you, in verse 16, take, two or, uh, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established in the evidence of two or three witnesses. Very interesting. You know how the Bible holds together as a complete whole? And the more you read it, the more you study it, the deeper you go into God's word, you think, wow. You know, 40 authors, 66 books, written over 1,500 years, holds together as a unity, speaking the same words. Now, when Jesus says, after he was resurrected, Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore I want you to teach. I want you to baptise. I want you to make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28, verse 20, let me steal the verse, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus talks about the end of the age and the ends of the earth, and he calls us to be his witnesses. It's a very interesting position to be aware of. I did not understand that. I grew up in the Sabbatarian church, and I think for the first 35 years of my life, I just sat in a seat and kept it warm. I sang the hymns and I had a smiley face, but suddenly I realised disciple means, discipleship means surrender. Discipleship means following Jesus, even if it costs me my life. And I'm thinking, oh, but I don't want to die. But, you know, this hands-on sense of stewardship is what I'm getting at today. And I really appreciated Rebecca talking to our next-door neighbour that you can come before the throne of grace and receive the prayer of faith to be healed. And we have a capacity of using our time, our talent and our treasure for the glory of God and not for our own personal needs. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about the two witnesses, they are anointed prophets of God that stand in a unique time and place in history. You and I have that question is, well, are we in that time yet? Are we there yet? Um, I understand from John chapter 3, verse 27, John the... The, the, John the Baptist says, a man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from above. 
The New International Version says a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. So you and I are all given gifts, opportunities, resources. And so after eating the scroll, John is commissioned to share it with the world. And that sets up the ministry of the two witnesses. And like olive trees filled with the Spirit and lampstands that are light of the world, they minister brightly and powerfully. And like Moses and and Elijah, they minister the law and the prophets fulfilled in Christ. Brothers and sisters, we haven't been called to an easy task, have we? It means following in the footsteps of Jesus. It means being empowered by the Holy Spirit because we can't by ourselves. It means living our lives in the service of God and sharing of the hope and the promise of eternal life. Do you still have questions? We all do. So did those first century disciples. When they, Acts chapter 1, I want to, I want to sign off on this. We went to Acts 1 before, beginning in verse 6. The disciples had a question. They were standing with Jesus and they said, Lord, are you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So we have questions sometimes associated with the times in which we live. I have children and grandchildren who used to say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And we think, oh no, we've still got 20 minutes to go. And Jesus says to them, he said to them, it is not for you to know in verse 7 of Acts 1, the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Within the Church of God's Seventh Day, we talk about the appointed times of the Lord. Today, Sabbath worship fellowship is a weekly appointed time. But he says two things. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that happened at the appointed time on the day of Pentecost. You study the life of Peter, he was a totally different man after the Holy Spirit came on him. And we know that the work of witness is only enabled by the Holy Spirit. Number two, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he'd said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took Jesus out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, in verse 10, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. So you see two, even in the angelic realm. When the Lord came down to Sodom and Gomorrah, he had two angels with him. When the women went to the tomb, there were two angels there. Now as Jesus ascends to heaven, there's two, the power of witness again. And Jesus said, men of Galilee, sorry, and the angel said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you in heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. And the work of the two witnesses happened between the sixth trumpets and the seventh trumpet. And the seventh trumpet is the coming of Jesus, the resurrection of the saints, and together with the saints, the two witnesses are raised back to life. Brothers and sisters, we live in an interesting and a wonderful time where the revelation of Jesus Christ shows us things that are yet to come. And you and I are called to be witnesses of Jesus. It's a privilege, it's an honour, but it is also a responsibility to take to heart. Thank you.